There are two things that I'd like to discuss which are strictly the domain of pre-processing. The first one you're very familiar with. It's time gain compensation. We've discussed it in detail earlier in the lecture series. Time gain compensation is just applying different receiver gains to different depths in the image. The key point I want you to remember is that time gain compensation is a receiver function. And because it's a receiver function, it's pre-processing. The next thing is slightly more complicated. It's called logarithmic compression. And the one thing you need to remember about this is not to be intimidated by the math in the name. What logarithmic compression is requires a little discussion of dynamic range. Remember, dynamic range is the ratio of the lowest signal we have to the highest signal we have. Compression is just a term for making this large dynamic range small, and we'd like to do it without losing too much information. It's really important because even if our display could display the entire dynamic range of the transducer, the human eye has a much smaller dynamic range than the ultrasound receiver or the image memory or the display screen. So we need to compress down that signal just so that we can see all of the information we have. The way that most ultrasound uh, machines do this is with logarithmic compression. You may remember the log function from its use as an instrument of torture in high school. I don't want you to be afraid of the log. I want you to remember that the log makes your life easier. The log is basically just taking whatever the exponent is of your number and representing the number as that. For example, we could compress a signal consisting of the numbers 10, 100, 1000, and 10,000 using logarithmic compression down to 1, 2, 3, 4. That's going from a dynamic range of 1,000, from 10 to 10,000, to a dynamic range of 4. Practically speaking, what logarithmic compression means is that small signals become bigger, and big signals become smaller. So your signals get pushed closer together, but you don't lose too much information. That's really all that has to be done in pre-processing. Now let's talk about what has to be done in post-processing. Well, the really important one you use all the time. Freeze frame and CineLoop. Whenever you hit the freeze button, we display the most recent frame that's been stored from memory. And whenever you scroll back and forth to those most recent images, you're scrolling through the CineLoop. Remember, the transducer frame rate is not the same as the display frame rate. Our transducer is taking pictures faster than our display, our TV, can display them. So the problem here is that we need to scan in real time. I want to still be able to see the most current image when I'm looking at the screen. But I also don't want to lose those frames the transducer is producing because one of those frames might be the frame that I really need. The solution is the simile. We store all the frames, and whenever you hit frozen or freeze, you can scroll back through the most recent frames obtained. That's the CineLoop. The stored frames are the CineLoop. And that is a post-processor function. The other thing that needs to be done in post-processing is read zoom. Because read zoom starts from an image that's stored in memory. And it displays that zoomed area over the entire screen. It doesn't add any new pixels, it just stretches the ones that are already there. It doesn't use any more ultrasound. It does need to be done in post-processing because it is a read function. As we have previously alluded to, many functions can be done in either pre-processing or post-processing. On modern machines, because we have very fast computers and lots of memory, these things are almost exclusively done in post-processing. The first of these things is called frame averaging. This is another partial solution to the problem of having more frames coming from the transducer than we can display on the screen. 
we take multiple frames from the sim loop and we average the pixel values from those frames to produce the frame that you see on the screen. This does a pretty good job of reducing artifacts and often improves image quality, but it does so at the cost of reducing temporal resolution. Because if you see a frame that takes place over the time frame of four frames gathered from the transducer, your ability to see individual frames in individual spots of time is reduced. A more advanced version of this technique is called persistence. In persistence, every frame you see is a weighted average of multiple previous frames, with the most weight given to the most recent frames. We've saved the most important of these processing features for last. Fill-in interpolation. Remember that when we talked about the image produced by the transducer, we said that it may have many different shapes based on the transducer morphology. Some of these shapes, like curvilinear or phased array, may have large gaps between pixels in the far field. Without interpolation, the final image the scan converter produced would be multiple lines with huge gaps between them. Rather than leave those gaps there, we use fill-in interpolation. Fill-in interpolation predicts what those missing pixels would look like. It's another averaging technique. For example, if you look at the image we have here, we can imagine that the two lines you see could have a gap between them, or a pixel value of zero, to begin with. Interpolation would say, well, on one side we have an image with a pixel value of 12, and on the other side we have one with a pixel value of 6. Let's split the difference and call that a pixel value of 9. Most interpolation techniques are more interconnected uh, and more complicated than just averaging and do much more complicated transformations based on the other ultrasound parameters to give you a more realistic image. But this gives you the basic concept. Let's pause for another question. Which of the following must be a post-processor function? Interpolation, frame averaging, logarithmic compression, or CineLoop? You may pause the video to decide on your answer. The answer is CineLoop. Remember that the CineLoop is part of that freeze frame technology and it displays all of the frames that have recently been put into memory. To do that, you need to have those frames already assembled, so it's a post-processing technique. Let's move on to display devices. I apologize ahead of time, because most of these display devices are things you won't see clinically. However, they are fa fair game for the ARDMS exam. The first one we'll talk about is the television, or the cathode ray tube monitor. This is basically what your regular non-HD TV or your regular non-flat panel computer monitor works on. They're based on something called a cathode ray tube. A cathode ray tube, or CRT, consists of an electron gun, a vacuum chamber, and phosphors. Now these phosphors are chemical spots that light up a specific color when hit by electrons from the electron gun. The electron guns are at the back of your TV. If we're talking about a black and white TV, we're talking about one electron gun. In a color TV, there are three, each corresponding to a color, red, green, or blue. Electrons are fired by these guns toward the glass screen. They're aimed by electromagnetic coils that are near the gun, which sweep the beams of electrons across the screen. When the phosphors are hit by these electrons, they glow. The more electrons, or the higher the voltage you use, the brighter the image you get. 